You know, we've gotten some comments that I don't actually taste gear on gear tasting. Have isn't you seen it, those? Yeah, isn't it just a playoff wine tasting? Yeah, but you know, I was kind of considering the... Ugh, never mind. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Gear Tasting. Today I'm going to start off talking about a new book I just picked up off the table. Uh, actually, Simon, Simon & Schuster sent this to me. It's an advanced copy. It doesn't come out till September 20th, uh, but it's called Pearl Harbor from Infamy, Infamy to Greatness. So I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm a pretty big World War II buff, um, as you might have been able to see with the, uh, the stuff that we've done, like covering the World War II D-Day Museum. Uh, the in Virginia that I went to a while back, we did a pretty big pictorial on the on some photos from that museum, uh, as well as our Overlord patch collection that we did uh, in memorial of Operation Overlord. And I apologize for the gunfire in the background. That's the police training center next door doing work. So this is, you know, I, I was kind of looking at this book, think, thinking, you know, what's the difference between this and every other story on Pearl Harbor? So. Um, in their description, they talk about this being, uh, writ well, it's written by Craig Nelson and not the same Craig Nelson from Coach, uh, but this is packed with about five years of research. Um, it says it includes some newly available behind-the-scenes accounts from Tokyo, hundred, hundreds of new oral histories and memoirs from both the American and Japanese perspectives, uh, and a thorough re-examination of the federal investigation on the attacks to deliver the terror of Pearl Harbor. So. Looking forward to reading that. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk briefly today about what I view as writing consumables. I know that's kind of a lackluster topic, but it's one that I, that I feel like we should highlight because I think that there's some good info here that you might kind of want to pick up for what you guys do too at home. So um, I'm a big notebook person. I carry a notebook with me in my pocket wherever I go. Um, right now I'm actually carrying a, a not co notebook and I can't remember what they actually call this notebook but uh, there's a there's a name for it as you can see it's pretty well used from my pocket but um, I'm always constantly writing things down whether that's on the go when I'm out and about um, or whether it's carrying in my gear I always have a pocket or a, always have a pocket I always have pockets um, I always have a pocket notebook with me wherever I go so my I guess pocket notebook configuration and what I carry has changed over the years but it's largely a little bit stayed the same. So, you know, whenever I'm out and about, what I carry in my pocket is not a waterproof notebook, but then when I'm out in the field or something like that, I typically always have a waterproof notebook and a waterproof pen on me or a pencil, because uh, pencils are waterproof, obviously. So, um, what, I, what I used to carry, I kind of started out, um, I guess, carrying, I carried field notes for a very long time um, and then kind of progressed, uh, actually even predating field notes before that came out, I used to really, I was a sucker for these little green memorandum books in the Navy whenever I could find them. Uh, they had different sizes. Th there was actually a shorter size than this. This is the longer size, but uh, being a sucker for these notebooks and just liking the feel of these, um, we actually created our own little uh, spin-off of those. We call them our memo books. So, you know, these had the big memorandum across the top. These are our ITS done ones called memo books. Um, we tried to kind of get that same feel with the blue lines on the inside and things like that, but um, that's kind of our modern updated version of those. And, you know, I used to carry around a Skillcraft pen in the Navy. Um, these are little U.S. government pens, but we source those and we include those with every pack too. And it's not that I'm trying to push a product on you guys. I'm just telling you what I carry on a, on a regular basis too. So that NACO notebook travels with me sometimes. Sometimes I'll have one of these memo books. Um, sometimes I even have field notes. I've got an pretty big abundance of those too but then whenever I'm outdoors um, I typically have a waterproof notebook on me actually this kit that I'm going to talk about in a minute has what I carry actually so I can actually go over that so I carry one of these uh, spiral bound right in the rain notebooks uh, with waterproof paper but I, I kind of migrated away from this style to the spiral bound just because one of my pet peeves about this this style notebook is that you I have a hard time writing uh, in this because I, I can only write to about here because when I you know, set it down and I'm trying to write in it, 
this fold or the crease that's on the inside of the notebook prevents you from maximizing your writing space. So I kind of got tired of that and, and went to uh, spiral bound notebooks. You know, so I've used a lot of those in the past and then I like this black style a lot better. Uh, it's got some gray paper with it and this is uh, also kind of a, a subtle grid design and I'm, I'm a big fan of grid notebooks too. So that's kind of why I elected to do that. But again, this is waterproof paper and um, this was the notebook I actually had when I was in Buds. This is, it still has my Buds notes in it. And, and actually, as I'm looking through this, the, uh, the tips that I was giving to the guy going to Buds, this is, these are actually my notes from Buds on how to take care of like your UDT vest and stuff and how to prepare for a swim inspection. So anyway, it's kind of neat. And that's, that's what happens when you write with a non-waterproof pen on a waterproof notebook and go swimming with it. So that's what happens, it bleeds and things like that. I, you know, I had a, I think I'd talked about this before, but we carried sea wallets at Buds, which is just nothing more than a waterproof bag. Um, and they were a little bit more durable than the uh, lock sack bags. But, and, and when I say that, meaning that you could go, you know, hit the surf with them and other things like that. And um, they would stay together with lock sack bags when they get, you know, bumped into things and that you can actually tear holes in them and things like that. So there's other ones that aren't so uh, damageable. So, um, I can, uh, I actually wanted to read this real quick, uh, for the guy going to buds. Um, so you do remove the Schrader valve and that's what, uh, that's what I was talking about on there. Actually the Schrader valve is a protective valve. I think that's on the new actuators. Um, and they say to remove that because I can't remember if they came with those and it was damaging. I remember something about that. You can put silicone spray on the tip of that CO2 cartridge I was talking about on the UDT vests. Um, when you're carrying your Mark 131 flares, that's a kind of an octagonal, octagonal shaped, uh, octagon, octagonal, octagonal, I don't know what the hell that is. Uh, anyway, it's an orange smoke that you have when you're you know, doing your ocean swims, but um, that's the day flare and then the Mark 132 is the night flare and that's a, a white banded red flare. But uh, so they talk about how to, how to actuate that flare. Um, so, mask, when I was talking about storing in the UDT vest, the glass of the mask actually does face the chest when storing in the UDT life jacket. Fins are on your left during an inspection, just in case you want to know. Flare is on the right of your web belt and knife is on the left of the web belt. These are all the hit checkpoints for the uh, swim inspection. Uh, lightly silicone all the moving parts on your UDT vest. Uh, knife, you should rinse it, store it, and make sure there's no rust on it. Uh, flare mask and fins get a fresh water rinse after the swim web belt two life jacket inspection points no twists half hitches in the straps bow line with half hitch on the shot line that that's that little line that connects your mask to the udt vest so you don't lose it in the surf uh, no damage on the co2 tip uh, knife is handle forward blade inboard and fins on the left kind of interesting notes so only applicable to those going through a swim inspection but thought I'd read it anyway but yeah this was the notebook that I you know carried in my uh, in my sea wallet and as you can see I used to <laughs> I learned my lesson about writing with a non waterproof pen and carrying a waterproof notebook so um, just a real quick thing to go over real and I just want to talk about um, pen wise um, I always carry a small sharpie with me whenever I'm at the range just for marking targets and things like that um, I always got a waterproof pen this is a space pen I'm not a huge fan of this design, this two-part design here, uh, just because it always winds up, if I'm carrying this in my pocket, it always winds up untwisting and falling apart in my pocket. Uh, so hopefully maybe one of these days they'll fix that. And then Right in the Rain recently came out with these pencils. I like them. The, the only problem is the eraser comes off really easily in the back and all your lead dumps out. Uh, but they, they have thicker lead, which I like. Um, it doesn't break as easy, so they, they say it's a kind of unbreakable lead, which... I haven't had an issue with the lead breaking in these, so just uh, wanted to quickly go over some writing consumables. Welcome to Questions Over Coffee. So I wanted to field a few questions today. Um, I want to start out with uh, Camel Cam from Twitter, who asks, what's your take on monthly gear subscriptions worth it? 
Um, my personal opinion is I don't, and this is obviously my personal opinion, but I don't ha subscribe to any gear subscription stuff um, just because I never know what I'm going to get. And while that's lucrative to some people, they like the mystery involved in it, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just feel that continuing with those subscriptions, I, I sometimes wonder if I'm going to get my value. So if you're getting value from a subscription box, nothing wrong with that. By all means, keep doing it. Uh, but I know there's a lot of subscription boxes out there now, and that's been a very successful thing that people have done in the last couple of years. Um, our answer to that at ITS uh, was really kind of coming from my personal opinion, which is that I'd, I don't really like subscribing to those things. So we offered a, a mystery box, and we'd, we still offer those from time to time. Uh, they're always limited edition. You know, there's only a couple hundred of them, or I think there's a hundred that we put out. Um, and we usually say, you know, kind of the main patch that was in there. So like we just did one that had a, a throwback patch that we did a long time ago that people have been clamoring for again, which was our honey badger patch. And the one before we kind of did a, a special exclusive patch, which was a, you know, a, a commander type patch um, from G.I. Joe, uh, kind of our artistic parody around that. Um, so, and then we also include other mystery items. So we call it a mystery box because you see what the main image is or the main patch is, and then there's some other stuff involved in it too. So that way you can really decide whether you want to buy the box rather than kind of being subscribed to it and never really knowing what you get. But there's that inherent, like I've always, I always know I get a box every month and I've got mail and it's fun to open. So, you know, I see, I see both sides of it, um, honestly, from my perspective, but that's, uh, that's that. Next question is, let me do this one from Hank on Twitter, who asked, can you discuss plate carrier setup? Thank you, love what y'all do. Thanks, Hank. So, um, my preferred plate carrier setup is not to run pouches on the actual plate carrier itself. So, um, I started out a long time ago uh, when Mayflower first came up with this idea of docking in a chest rig. I wrote up a pretty extensive article that was many, many years ago now on ITS. Uh, but so they came out with this idea of taking a chest rig and just being able to dock it in on a plate carrier so you could actually change out your setup. So um, originally, yeah, so originally they had this uh, Molly backed panel and you could configure it however you wanted to, and that was one of the ways that you dock it in. Uh, but then you can always put on these chest or, uh, sorry, shoulder straps too and run it as an independent chest rig. So Mayflower was kind of first to the market with that design. Lots of companies have, have kind of used that as, as time has gone on. Um, but the, uh, this was kind of the first iteration of that back in the day it was this Mayflower low profile carrier. I think that's what they call it. I have it down here. Yeah, low profile armor carrier. And then this was their, uh, this is their Gen 5 split chest rig. Um, and you know, as you can see, it just docks in like this. And then as this, uh, as this design has, has kind of been updated, it's, uh, they've gone to, I think they're called chasm buckles, ITW chasm buckles. So they, they're more streamlined. It's not as, uh, I guess the, the female portion of the buckle is now kind of stuck down, if you will, on the, so it doesn't flap like this, uh, which gives it a little bit more uh, rigidity when you're mounting this a uh, little bit easier to dock it in without looking too so um, and then you know you've got your waist strap that comes around the whole rig itself but then you know you can always uh, interchange your loadout so you know if you wanted a different loadout depending on your mission set or whatever you were doing that day uh, you could just dock in a different one and you know if you needed to lighten the load for a while you could just take off this portion and just wear your body armor if you needed to so that's my preferred method I've also kind of experiment with the LBT stuff that's like that too and I like these as well uh, but the inherent value of the Mayflower is that you don't have to run two sets of uh, shoulder straps so you know with this you've got the shoulder straps from the plate carrier but then there's no shoulder straps to run the chest rig whereas with the LBT stuff you've got the chest rigs from the plate carrier and then this like 1961 carrier uh, goes over top of that so you can see you've got you know, kind of secondary shoulder straps, which, you know, can be a benefit too in their own right. Um, you know, if you have uh, like comms or some kind of routing on the, the chest rig itself, that can, you know, doff and don with the, with the unit itself. So um, I've used both of these. This is, in case you're curious, this is the 6094 Slick, 6094A Slick chest 
or a plate carrier. Um, and what I like about this, these, both these plate carriers actually, is you can run soft armor and plates in both of them. Um, I do prefer the, the setup for the Mayflower a little bit more, just because as you can see, they, they make armor that's cut specifically for the carrier. Um, and then the plate actually rides on top of that in its own separate pocket. Whereas with the LBT plate carrier, your soft armor and your plate goes in the same pocket. So there's not as much separation. Um, I just think this is a little bit better of a design in terms of uh, storing the plate separately. So that's that. So hopefully you got something over that. Um, I will link to the review that we did of the on Mayflower set up a long time ago. We did a pretty comprehensive video walkthrough. Um, and then this is, you know, in case you're wondering, is the mass gray stuff that I've gone over before. So from LBT, um, again, kind of hard to find that stuff. So um, hopefully I answered your question. Okay, so next question is from Tom W on Twitter. How about a gear tasting about coffee makers? Oh, and an update on Solomon Speed Assaults, if you have one. I actually do have an update. I wrote up a pretty comprehensive article not too long ago, which I will link to again in the description, uh, reviewing the Solomon Speed Assaults. Um, I've got some pretty detailed photos and some notes uh, from actually another contributor of ours too, Matt Sharp, who has been running some as well. So we kind of bounced off each other in the article, kind of talking about the pros and cons of the speed assaults, which um, there aren't too many cons, honestly. Um, I love them. I can't say enough good things about them. I'm, don't quote me on this, but I'm considering running them at Mammoth this year in January when I go to compete in that sniper challenge. So we will, we will see. I'm not quite positive on that yet, but I've got something in the works uh, with one of our contributors, Jason, who's uh, hopefully soon going to talk some, talk a little bit about weight when it comes to footwear. So little hint for that. Um, and then how about a gear tasting coffee makers? Um, instead of pulling out a bunch of good different coffee makers, I'd just like to talk about them. Uh, I think that would be a little bit better um, just because obviously my main coffee maker, my main man coffee maker is at home. Um, then we've got, basically here at the shop, we use a drip brew, uh, but we grind our own beans. So uh, right now we're drinking Spartan coffee uh, out of Texas. I like their coffee quite a bit. Um, this is their medium roast, made with organic and fair trade coffee beans sourth, sourced ethically from Colombia, carefully roasted to maintain the beans naturally high caffeine content, important, while still maintaining, or still producing a full bodied flavor, notes of orange, honey, and milk chocolate. So. That's what we're drinking currently, and the reason I'm talking about that too is that it's whole bean. We've been, we grind our own stuff here at the shop. Uh, Rob carefully measures the beans every morning, uh, producing a nice tasty drip brew. Uh, we've got a Brazza grinder here, which I think is one of the best grinders there are. Um, so there's a couple of different types of grinders out there. Um, there's burr grinders, which that brats is a burr grinder, and then you've got just your regular blade type grinder, which sucks. Don't buy one of those. Take my advice. If you're going to get into coffee uh, big time, which I totally got down that road. Um, I don't even really know how it happened. I just became a coffee snob in less than six months and went out and bought a really expensive uh, Breville espresso machine at home. And yeah, I went, I went full retard on that. So. Um, Anyway, the, so what I make at home in the mornings is I typically, I grind my beans with the uh, Breville machine and I typically make Americanos at home every morning. Uh, on the weekends, I'll kind of give myself a treat, make a cappuccino or something like that. And I'm perfecting my latte art. So that's how much of a, a coffee snob I've become. So I don't know, it's kind of cool learning about that. And I really don't know how baristas do it, but they've obviously got way too much time on their hands to worry about milk froth. So uh, I don't. I just kind of do my weekend cappuccino and hope for the best. But so that's what I use at home. Um, the the Breville that I have has a built-in burr grinder, so that's what I use at home too. And I used to have that Brazza grinder at home, and I brought it into the office, and that's what we use here now. Um, but so I've also kind of gotten on the AeroPress kick, thanks to Rob. Um, he's used the AeroPress for a long time, and I've gotten into trying to use one of those so that I'll have good coffee when I'm out and about or camping or something like that. Um, but prior to that, I've, I've made coffee a couple different ways. One was with the jet boil. Um, I used their coffee press and the jet boil to make coffee. And I'm actually a big sucker for percolator coffee when I'm camping. Um, that's kind of like the little coffee pot type deal that has a basket in the top where you put coffee grounds in and the water as it boils, so you can put it over the campfire. As that water boils, it 
it flows into the basket in the percolator and drips down into the bottom making coffee. Um, and I don't know what it is about, I don't know if it's just camp coffee, but it tastes really good to me, even though it's probably not so hot. I mean, I, God, we've even used Folgers a lot on Boy Scout campouts and stuff like that. And even though it's just crap coffee, it's, it still tastes good to me. So um, life's too short to drink crappy coffee, so that's that. Um, yeah, I think I hit all the, uh, the notes that I wanted to. Um, a funny story, though, is if you're considering an espresso machine and you want to make Americanos, don't buy an espresso. You can't do it. Um, Americano is just hot water and coffee, but, or coffee and espresso shot. Espresso shot and hot water, sorry. Uh, but I remember hearing a, a sales pitch from someone at, uh, I think we were at Williams-Sonoma, uh, Kelly and I, and she was going through, like, talking to a woman who wanted to make Americanos at home. She's like, oh, well, you can do that with an espresso. You just, uh, you put the pot in and make your espresso, and then you can come back in and just, you know, add some hot water or something. And that's really not the way you need to make an Americano. Um, that's, sorry, that's coffee snob in me coming out, but that's that. So thanks for the question, Tom. Hopefully that answers a little bit of it. And uh, anyway, life's too short to drink crappy coffee. Hey guys, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. Remember, use the pound tag Gear Tasting on any of the social media networks and we'll answer your questions here on the show. Uh, if you're liking what we're doing here on Gear Tasting, please consider joining the Crew Leader membership. Details are below in the description, along with a lot of the links to some of what I was talking about here in the show today. And thanks for your support.